Thank you, Micah and worship team for leading us through songs of worship, expression in our heart to God in this time. If you got your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32, beginning with verse 1. Second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 32. God blessed my wife and I with the gift of three daughters. And two of my daughters are going through this time that we like to call teenage driving. I have uh, joked with other parents until my children came along that uh, it will really increase and better your prayer life. And trust me, I'm being serious. It works on your prayer life. I pray every time my daughters leave the house and uh, I pray as they return home as they're driving. But I've noticed not only has it worked on my personal prayer life, but it's also made me keenly aware of the signs on the road. We are inundated with signs everywhere of warning. There's construction ahead. This is speed zone. You need to stop here. These lanes close. All of these signs are warnings. And I'm quick to point those out to my daughters as well as we ride. Did you see that? Well, there are warning signs all around us, not just on the road, in our homes, in our lives. And I noticed as I was reading some news, some interesting warnings. Uh, Some of these warnings become legislation. They become laws. And I've noticed of recent, the past couple of years, that laws are being placed on texting. First of all, there's a big push on texting and driving. Don't do it. But it even goes further than that. Don't text and walk. And I'm not joking with you. That's true. They're saying don't text and walk. Are you one of these people that you're texting and you're walking down a hallway, maybe the hospital or at your uh, business, and you just stop? And people all of a sudden have to start walking around you. And you become an obstacle. Well, it has become a problem. People have noticed this. And laws are being placed in states to not text and walk. This may sound ridiculous, but in New Jersey, they've placed a law. They call it careless walking. And they will charge you $85 if you're carelessly walking and texting. In Utah, they've passed... I'm not joking about this stuff. I don't do that. In Utah, they've passed a law. It's called distractive walking and you will be fined fifty dollars and you may think this is crazy but it's true ohio Ohio state university did a research a couple of years ago when this first started taking place and being noticed and they found in one year alone over a thousand people nationwide had to go to the emergency room because they were texting and walking it goes further than that Back in March of this year, a 45-year-old lady was texting, walking on a pier at Lake Michigan. She walked right off of it. She had to be rescued from that. And then, and then this past month, or excuse me, this month of September, a lady, a lady in Kodiak, Alaska was texting at her home and she slipped off a 60-foot cliff into the ocean and she had to be rescued from it. Those are some... Uh, some, some warning signs that we need to pay attention to, to take heed to. And I want to share with you a warning sign today that I found in the Old Testament, Exodus, as we speak and talk about uh, worship in the, today and the days ahead. I want us to look at this warning sign in Exodus 32. Uh, if you know Exodus very well, you'll know that uh, it's about the, the Israelites' journey out of Egypt, out of slavery, as they were led by Moses. And the first part of Exodus, it's a narrative account. It talks about how they made it out, how God sent plagues to uh, uh, remove, uh, allow them to be released from Egypt and slavery. And as you move through this narrative account, which is very interesting and easy to read, you come upon the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. But in verse 20, or in chapter 21, And through the remainder of the book, it starts talking about these laws, these regulations. Stuff like Sabbath regulations. It talks about dietary concerns. All of this stuff that if you're reading through the Bible and you're trying to stay interested in it, all of a sudden you kind of get bogged down in and you start slowing down and 
It talks about the priest's clothes. That's not interesting. And so we, we kind of slow down. But would you, do you realize if you read from chapter 20 to chapter 40, inserted in there is chapter 32 where it takes a different spin. It takes a look at a warning sign. And this warning sign is man's way of meeting and worshiping God. Whereas in before, this has been God's way of meeting and worshiping Him. The way that He prescribed. But now, in chapter 32, we're looking at man's way. How man wants to worship. How man wants to meet with God. And may this text serve as a warning sign for us how not to worship. How not to worship. Look with me at uh, verse 1, chapter 32 of Exodus. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off your rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a, a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And those they rose up early the next day and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up for play. As we look at this, uh, this passage about the life and the history of the Israelites, I hope we'll take this as a warning for us today. A warning of how not to worship. There's several warning signs, there's several principles, several truths here. And the first one is, don't trust God. If you don't want to worship, if you don't want to meet with God, just don't trust Him. It says in verse 1, the people saw that Moses had gone up on the mountain and he had delayed. You see, God was meeting with Moses up on the mountain. He was prescribing, giving all of these uh, ideas, these laws about how to meet with Him. How to worship. And He had been gone 40 days, 40 nights, and they were soon to forget God, and they sought to find other ways to worship. It's interesting how they all of a sudden became uncomfortable with what God wanted, and they began to look for something that they could handle. We fall into sin when we tend to want to prescribe to God what He should do. When we don't trust Him to know what He's doing, we sin. And to worship this eternal, this invisible God, it requires faith. Something that may not be very tangible, but yet we have to express our faith. That's how we worship Him is through faith. And the children of Israel were quick to forget what God had done. If you look at Psalms, um, Psalms 106, verses 19 through 22, it's a recounting of this experience that takes place in Exodus of how they worshiped the golden calf. In verse 19, it says, They made a calf in Horeb and they worshiped a metal image. And they exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. And they forgot God, their Savior who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. They had forgotten all that God had done in the past. How He brought them out of Egypt. How He parted the sea. How He had provided for them. They forgot all that God had done for them. They also forgot what they had committed to Him. If you go back in Exodus to Exodus 19, it says that God met with them the community of Israel with the elders. He met with them at the bottom of the mountain. And He said, I'm going to share with you what I expect. And they said as one, we will do all that you say. They committed themselves to this. And 40 days later, they're growing impatient. 
Now they're, they're, they're forgetting what He's done. They're forgetting what they've said. And they've decided to trust not in God, but to trust in themselves. As they turn to, to Aaron and say, make us a God. Make us an idol. How often do we forget what God has done for us? How often do we forget what He has promised in His Word? How often do we forget and not trust Him when we don't trust, when we don't display this faith? This is not worship the true living God. This is just wanting to find something for self. This is looking after self. This is being selfish. And it's giving value to our personal wants, our desires. Remember, I shared with worship. It comes from that word worth. Ship, to give worth or value to something that you place your focus, your attention on. When we come together in here on Sunday mornings, we call this worship. We come to give worth and value to who? Sometimes we come wanting to value ourselves. But worship is to be that time when we place our attention and focus on God. To trust Him, even when we can't see Him, but to trust Him in what He's done and what we say as we have committed our lives to Him. A second warning sign found in Exodus 32 is to take worship into your own hands. Make it on your own terms. Verse 2 says, the people went to Him and said, make us gods. Make these gods so that they can go before us. How arrogant do you think that is? To say, Make God's force. Make these gods go on before us. Make these gods lead us. Not, what do you want, God? Where are you leading me? There, the arrogance and the pride of the Israelites is very evident in their desire to take worship and place it in their own hands and do their own thing. Last week, uh, Chad, our encounter pastor, preached from John chapter 8. In part of his comments, he says, we have an incomplete view of Jesus. If you recall, if you were here with us last week, he said every time Jesus says something that is loving or beneficial, we're quick to grab hold of that and say, hey, that's for me. But when Jesus says something that's harsh, that makes us uncomfortable, what do we say? Oh, that's for them, right? See, we want to take Jesus and make Jesus into a comfortable Jesus. A Jesus we can handle. And if not, we want to take and mold Him and make Him fit our desires. You know, we all have our preference when it comes to what takes place in worship, corporate worship. We all have our preferences. I have my preferences at home. Uh, I have my own idiosyncrasies. And I ask my wife, I says, what are some of those things that I just drive you nuts? And she didn't say a word. But um, there is one thing I noticed that is one of those preferences in my life at home. Um, as I mentioned, my daughters are driving. We had to add an additional vehicle to the Leonard fleet. And if it's not hard enough to keep one car maintained, clean, try putting three to keep up with. Well, I have this little preference. I want my cars washed and cleaned a certain way. You know, there's a certain way. There's a certain place you start. You don't start on the tires. You start on the top of the car. And so I'm, I'm teaching my daughters, and they're very gracious. They come out there and help me when I wash the cars. You know, I tell them there's a certain way you hold the hose. You, you don't want to go crazy with it. I have a preference of how to wash a car. My wife does too. It's to give the person on gun barrel $5 and he'll wash it. That doesn't fit. I'm like, you just gave up $5. And the whole time, I'm, my part of my preference or my schedule is I wash them about once every six months. So I don't know, $5 is not that big a deal. But that may, may sound silly and pretty simplistic. But you know, we all have our preferences. When we entered this room today, we came with an idea of what music we wanted to hear, who we wanted to listen to speak. We, we, we had an idea of that we want this topic to be very relevant and applied to my life. 
We all have our preferences. And we have to be careful, run the danger and the risk of wanting to make God on our own terms. To mold Him and make Him do what we want. It's a warning sign that we can learn from the Israelites is they had Aaron mold a calf for them. A calf and a God that they would have and force to lead them out. There's also the warning sign here that that we need to make sure worship is demanding and burdensome. We, we, want our, we don't want our worshipers to enjoy it. We want it to be a burden rather than willing participants, excited, expectant. Moses, uh, Aaron, Moses' brother, was, had been chosen to be one of their priestly leaders. And they acknowledged him as such. And they, they came to him in Moses' absence and said, make us gods. And so Moses says, bring me your gold. Give me your gold. Now, if you remember, these folks were slaves. They weren't very rich people. So where did this gold come from? It came from Egypt. If you go back to the history of the Israelites, when God led them out of Egypt, it says that they turned to the Egyptians and asked, for gold, for clothing. And they basically voluntarily plundered the Egyptians, taking this gold. Now this gold was not to make these Israelites wealthy. No, this would be used later. As you read all those chapters about the tabernacle, the elements that are in the tabernacle, they're going to be covered in gold. God was already making provisions and making plans for that gold that was being received from the Egyptians. And now, and, and he was going to ask a free will offering. Not necessarily give me all of the gold, but just, okay, we're going to build this uh, wash basin. It's going to be covered in gold. We're going to build this ark. It's going to be covered in gold. Would you bring some gold? That was going to be their free will offering. But instead, Aaron turns to them and says, give me your rings. Give me the rings out of your son's ears, your daughter's ears, your wife's ears. Give me, give me, give me. Give me. Isn't that interesting? When we think, when I say give me, it makes us think about worship. We think of the offering time. When we take up the offering plate, when we talk about the offering, what runs through your mind? Is it a burden? Do you feel guilt-ridden if you don't put something in there? You know, the... Apostle Paul, when he spoke about giving and worship, he said God loves a cheerful giver. He didn't say anything about how much. The offering is an expression in worship of our gratitude to God. Because everything we have is God's. Everything that, he, that we possess is God's. It's a gift from Him. And so it's basically coming to Him open-handed and saying, God, thank You. What do You need of this? It's not to make it where we feel guilty when the offerings plate is passed. It's not for us to feel guilty if we can't make it to worship next week. Worship is not meant to be demanding and a burden, but it's to be something that we enjoy. Something that we willingly participate in. Another warning sign found in this account can be where you decide who God ought to be rather than how He actually reveals Himself. In verse, in verse 2, Aaron's words to the people literally say, this is your God. He's created it and now He says, here it is. This is your God. R.C. Sproul, a theologian, says, the cow gave no law and demanded no obedience. It had no wrath or justice or holiness to be feared. It was deaf, dumb, and impotent. But at least it could not intrude on their fun and call them to judgment. This was religion designed by men, practiced by men, and ultimately useless to men. I'm amazed as a, as a minister, as I look and I see people come and go from churches, because sometimes what we offer is useless religion. Rather than expressing and sharing the truth of what we find in Scripture, of who God is and what He desires of us, 
we ask, what can I do or how can I make this mine? You may wonder why they asked or why Aaron fashioned a cow. What in the world? You could have chosen any other animal. You chosen a dog, a cat, anything. But why a cow? Well, this was not uncommon in that area. In Egypt, where they had spent hundreds of years, they worshipped cattle. In the new land that they now occupied, Baal worship was, was also assimilated into a, a worship of cows. In this pagan worship, they looked at the presence of the God residing over the idol. So as they built this golden calf, they thought God is right here over this cow. This was taking something from another culture and bringing it in and putting it into their religion. It's syncretism. And we do the same thing. We look to the Hindus, and we may not call it Hinduism, we, we call it karma. We believe in that. That's not found here, but that's over there. Or we may look to the Mormons and say, uh, I'm going to be a good person. I'll be good enough. God will receive me, accept me. That's not presented here. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. This is a bringing together of all these different religious beliefs and making up what we want to be known as Christianity. It's actually deciding how we want God to re react versus how He reveals Himself through Scripture. It's mixing the truth. And when you mix the truth, it's no longer, when you mix it with the false, it's no longer truth. Another warning sign is found in verses 4-6 through six, where Aaron created a calf, he created an altar, he even created a festival. He created a religious system. And this warning sign is create your own God. Make sure you can't see or speak or act. Create your own altar, create your own sanctuary, create your own rituals, your own festivals. If you don't want to meet with God, create all of this for yourself. It's easy for us to be quick to, to uh, judge the Israelites and say, hey, you, you chose a cow. Why in the world would you, would you worship a cow? But don't we do the same thing? Don't we worship some of the most ridiculous things? One of my favorite books is a book my wife presented to me. It's a children's book, The Wretched Stone. I've shared this with some of our students as part of a Bible study. And the author, author Chris Van Osberg, he tells a story of a captain and his crew that set sail on a voyage. They encounter an island, and on this island they find this special stone. Well, they pick this stone up and they take it to their boat. And all of a sudden, this, this, this crew becomes very consumed with this stone. No longer do they sing. No longer do they dance. No longer do they, are they creative. Are they industrious? All of a sudden, they become very consumed with this stone focusing all their attention on this stone. Now, they become sick. They become overweight. Now, they don't get anything done. They No longer do they play or dance or sing because they are consumed with this wretched stone. Finally, the captain notices the problem and does away with the stone. And they return back to the days of former. This... Uh, this work by Van Allsburg was an attempt to point out to us how we're consumed with TV. For those of you who are not familiar with TVs a couple of years ago, they weren't this wide, they were about this big around. They looked like a stone. They had a tube. And so it was huge. I've got one that uh, sits on a dresser right now and I'm fearful this thing is just going to fall off. But it was huge. It, it resembles somewhat of a stone. How often do we become consumed with that wretched stone? How often do we become consumed by those who appear on that stone? We allow people, we allow the media, we allow celebrities to influence our political opinions. We allow actors and actresses to have a voice. They influence us as to what is in style, whether it be clothes or physical appearance. 
They even have a say and a voice over our morals, what is right and what is wrong. We give them that authority because we're so consumed with them. We allow them to be our gods and goddesses. We empower them. In very similar fashion, the Israelites became consumed for a moment with this golden calf. They became so consumed that they create a whole religious system around it. Another warning sign that you can find in this account is found in verse 6 where it says they, they, Aaron created festival activities. He said, we're going to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices tomorrow. And when we make the purpose of meeting with God and worship Him about gratifying self rather than glorifying Him, then it's no longer worship. The idea and the definition of worship is to give value worth it to that which is worthy. And using God's name to endorse our agenda to benefit us instead of getting worth to the one who's deserving is wrong. It's sin. I remember as a kid growing up, we would come home from church and my parents would quiz me about the service. And we would evaluate the service. I hope y'all don't do that. Evaluate the pastor. What did he say? Was it any good? And I remember as a child thinking, I didn't get anything out of it. Have you ever used that expression? At the very heart of that comment is self. Make it about yourself. Whereas worship is not about us, it's about God. And placing the attention and the focus on Him. And giving value and worth to Him. Recently, I, I led a Bible study with our students. And I, I got home and I shared with my family, I was really bummed out. The words didn't come, they didn't flow. The students were super. They were great. They were gracious to me all the time. They were sitting there looking at me, paying attention. And I got home and I was just so bummed out. I did not feel good about what I said. It didn't come out the way I'd planned it. And I got home and just I was really down in the dumps. And my family tried to encourage me. And, and in a moment of just being by myself, I realized, Tony, it's not about you. It was just as if the Spirit said, Tony... That Bible study was not about you feeling good about what you've just done. That Bible study is about you being faithful to give me worth and value. When we come into this room, do we come in here with the, the idea of what do I get out of it? Will I be happy with what takes place in here? Will I like the songs that Micah chooses? Or will I come in here regardless of who shows up and what we sing, and what the, the pastor shares, it's not about me. The, uh, I was, my wife shared with me a picture from a popular magazine of the tsunamis that have taken place in Southeast Asia. You've seen many pictures of the devastation. We've been, very, we've been made aware of all the destruction that's taken place in Southeast Asia and in Thailand, Japan, the tsunamis that have taken place in the past 10 years. And there was one image my wife shared with me. that It's this image of the tsunami, the great wave that is coming towards the village. And it, you can just see it. It's just ominous how it's coming forward. And people are standing there with mixture of emotions and reactions. For some, the obvious is, let's get out of here. You see fear on their faces and they're turning and they're frantically trying to escape this incredible wave of water. But then there's some that are in this picture and it's just like somebody photoshopped them in there because they're looking at this wave going, wow, that's big. It's almost as if they don't believe it. There are warning signs all around us, folks. And there are warning signs found here in Exodus 32 that we need to heed. And in the same fashion, the folks, some were able to heed those warnings of the tsunami, but others didn't. 
And I hope my desire as I've shared and I've looked at this and studied is that we would acknowledge these, these dangers in worship. And that we would not be found guilty, but that we would have a desire to worship in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said. I want to close on a more positive note. I've given you a how not to list, but I want to close on a more positive note. I would encourage you to read the rest of the chapter 32 because the story doesn't end there, but I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. I'm going to spoil the whole plot here of what takes place. In verse 7, it says that uh, God says to Moses, go down to your people. I've seen what they've done. I've seen the altar. I've seen the cow. I see what they're doing. Go down to them, and you're going to see my wrath played out. And Moses responds back to him. He says, oh, God, don't. Don't do that. Your reputation, your name is at stake. You promised Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You promised them that they would be a great nation by your name. You brought them out of Egypt. Remember what you promised. And how can you bring them out into this desert only to kill them? Now, Moses is not becoming the greater and God the lesser here, but Moses is beginning to grasp this idea of what God's plan is. And God tells him to go on down to his people. And he goes down and, and Moses shares his wrath. He breaks the tablet that God's hand is written on. And he takes the calf, he grinds it up, and makes them drink it. Many of them die. He approaches the people and says, who is for him? And people come forward. The Levites come forward. He says, get your swords. You've got work to do. And they go out and kill thousands. How they determined, I don't know. We don't hear that here in this account. They go out and kill thousands. A plague would come on the people and more would die as a result of the consequences of this sin. But if you continue to read this account, it says that the next day Moses said, approached the people and said, you sinned a great sin. And he says, I'm going to go up to God and perhaps I can make atonement for this sin. Now, as I looked at this list of warning signs, folks, I see myself there. I'm not pointing fingers at you. I see myself there. Things that I don't need to do in worship. But as I look at this remainder of the story and I hear about Moses being a mediator, the go-between, I see someone else. I see Jesus. There's a, there's a foreshadowing of the Jesus that's coming. For one day, God said to His Son, go down to your people. He said, I'm going to show you my wrath. The wrath on this sinfulness. And Jesus went down to, the, to, to His people, the creation. And He lived and taught. And then as He approached the cross, one night, he gets on his knees and prays. And his prayer is not a prayer of let me make you, God, do what I want. But his prayer is a prayer of selflessness. And he says, not my will, but your will be done. A great example of worship. Who do we worship when we come into this place? How do we worship? Here's the one that's worthy of our worship. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for these words. And unfortunately, Father, as we read this account of the Israelites, Father, we learn from their mistakes. And Father, we pray that we would take heed to the warning signs that are here. Father, may we take heed and uh, not make You to be God and conform to our desires. But Father, may You be who You are. May You reveal Yourselves to us. And Father, I pray as we read the example of Moses and the coming of our Savior, Father, I pray that we'd understand the reason we have for worship. We understand who it is we are here to worship. Who we're here to meet with. Father, I, I thank You for loving us enough 
to give your son Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, you've got two pieces of paper at your disposal. One is announcements about things that are going on. Please take heed to those. Those aren't warnings. Those are just encouragement uh, that you'll take part in some of those opportunities. Uh, but I do want to encourage you to take that uh, wonderings about worship. Take a minute, if you haven't jotted down a question or two, take a minute to jot those down. And uh, Bill Lowry uh, will be at the back door to collect those as you exit. I pray that you have a good day. Make sure you're here this evening at 6 o'clock for a special uh, ordination of deacons. Uh, be here at 6 o'clock for that. May God bless you and may you have a great day.